Today's COVID update is brought to you by Fultech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And we're back, and we're moving into our first conversation for this morning. We have a uh, two representatives from the Belize Tourism Industry Association of Belize. Uh, yesterday, they released the results of a poll that they did with their members looking at the reopening of the International Airport. And here to help us uh, unpack the results and what it means, we have John Burgos, the Executive Director, and Stuart Crone, the second Vice President. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Marlene and Gavin. All right, gentlemen. So. Uh, Definitely some interesting information coming out uh, from your poll. And let's start off, I think, with some of the basics. We need to understand uh, who participated and how many people participated. John? Um, well, our, the survey was sent to the entire membership. Mm -hmm. um, we used the database for 2019, and we, were, we managed to get a 30% response from our members, which is standard um, and recognized level of, of responses for such um, surveys, no? And, and you know, our membership is very diver diverse. We have a majority being hotels and resorts. Uh, thereafter, we have tour operators. Um, then we have uh, tour guides, and then we have smaller businesses such as chocolate companies, um, arts and craft companies. Um, so, that is who comprises the voices that, that were represented on the survey. Okay. So uh, what you wanted to do was to find out from your members um, exactly where their thoughts were on reopening the airport, whether the July 1st date specifically is one they wanted you to advocate for. Um, talk to me about some of the other information you tried to get through the survey. Yeah, as you, as you rightfully stated, that was the key purpose was to, we wanted to get a, a, a well, a good understanding of what the, how the membership feels about the reopening of the Philip Gorson International Airport. And, and of course, how soon. Mm -hmm. um, so it was focused on the question of July, opening in July. And then it was, the, the, we followed up with questions inquiring as to what would make them feel safe to fully support the reopening of the, of the PGIA. And, and we were very pleased to see the results that, uh, that we got. Um, overall, we can safely say that an 88% of the membership are in support of reopening the, the, the Philip Goldstone International Airport, but with the right safeguards in place. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is the, for me, that is the, the main thing that I take away from, from the survey. Mm -hmm. uh, and that speaks volumes to, to how logical and practical our, our membership is really thinking. And, really understanding the situation with the, with the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah. So let's put it all into perspective here, because I, I think for a while, um, or at least up until a few weeks ago, uh, the tourism sector, they were kind of banking on a July 1st reopening. And when the prime minister announced uh, that, in fact, that would not be the date, um, and he could not be able to define a date, that's when we started to hear individual businesses and uh, entities start to ad advocate individually for them to follow through on the July 1st date. Stuart, so weigh in for me here because you, you do have a, a hotel, um, Placencia we know is, is one of the hard hit areas as well. Um, what's the sense that you're getting there about defining the date or July 1st specifically? I think Marlene, there's a lot of <clears throat> there are a lot of misconceptions about this whole question of when are we going to open the airport. For me, the big question is not when you open the airport. The question is, when can you open the airport safely? Mm -hmm. A lot of the debate that is now going around both in public and in, in private about the airport opening, the debate is not wh when to open the airport. The debate is how do you define safely? So I think if you listen to the prime minister, I think he's he's trying to weigh and balance um, all the factors. And so you hear things like a, a five minute PCR test or 
um, on the other side at the points of, of disembarkation of embarkation in the states, people might need to have a, uh, a, a, a COVID-19 test within 72 hours before they get on the plane. Yeah. So these are the kind of things that go into opening the airport safely. Yeah. I think what the prime minister has determined is that these kind of tests, whether it's a rapid test or a 72 hour test in the United States or Canada are at the present time, not feasible. Okay, so I think that's why there's some vacillation about when you're going to open the airport. I think the prime minister's hope is that some of this, the, 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 the science um, improves in the near future. And when the science is better, when we do have a true five minute rapid test that we might be able to employ, then he's more comfort comfortable opening the airport once that date um, takes place. Of course, at some point, even if these safeguards are not practical, at some point, I think we all recognize that because tourism is such an important part of the economy, at some point, I think he's used the date November 1st, that if these things are still not in place or feasible by November 1st, you've got to take a chance because you don't want to destroy the economy. So I think a, a lot of the debate that's going on, it's a, it's a little bit false. Um, that it's, I, I think most of the, 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 supposedly you have two sides arguing back and forth, but the argument is really about the question of when can you safely open the airport, yeah. um, not when do you open the airport. And we can all differ on what do we think, what constitutes um, safe practices. And I think we can legitimately disagree on those things. What John is saying is that our membership is split right down the middle on the question of um, when the airport can safely open. And because our membership is split down the middle, we BTIA as an organization would not presume to try and take a hard lobbying position for one date or the other. We think that the prime minister has the access to the best knowledge. He's an elected official. He's a responsible person. And what we are saying is we are happy to have him weigh all the options and, and lead the country as he was elected to do. Um, but, um, you know, in the absence of having that date um, and perhaps not even uh, a firm position on what the um, you know, however the airport can open and how it can open safely. Um, if we don't have a lot of that information, how difficult then is it for you and in, and perhaps your members have also um, voiced their concerns just about uh, planning for the future and um, how they can um, sort of alleviate sort of difficulties that they're facing right now. Because I imagine that without um, certainty in, 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 in any of those areas, it's very difficult for a hotel or a tour operator or somebody to see the way forward or to have some sort of hope that um, business might pick up back soon. So I'm wondering how, if, if your members have, dealt, have, have, have voiced those concerns to you. Um, Gavin, I can tell you that, the, that that is the issue. The main mm -hmm. concern is the having, not knowing when the, the airport is gonna be opening. You know, the, the, uh, you, you, you remember, our tourism is based on people planning their vacations ahead of time. Um, so if we have bookings for July, and we're saying that we're not gonna be opening July, you're already beginning to cancel those, those bookings for July. So then you look at like August. If you have bookings for August, whether you're a tour operator or, or, or accommodations, you, you, you have to begin to look at canceling those. Mm -hmm. Now, what is happening is a lot of people were at the beginning over the last three months were able to reschedule their, their vacations that they had already paid for mm -hmm. um, to a later date. Some of them moved to July, some of them moved to August, some of them moved to September, October, and so on. So, the having this unknown of not having an exact date to reopen is what really puts more an additional pressure on the on the tourism stakeholders mm -hmm. because they can't plan around it. So what we, what I think the membership is saying is that where are the plans for the opening of the PGIE? Is the lease ready and its stakeholders ready to reopen the Philip Coulson International Airport? And that is where I think we, we are going to be focusing. We know that the Ministry of Tourism has some, is working on some national guidelines. 
we know that the lease tourism board is working so on, a, on more detailed guidelines for, for specific businesses on their accommodations and uh, tour operators, transportation, uh, and restaurants. So, so but these plans are still on their on, on the work. Uh, we we believe that they're going to be available um, by the ending or before the ending of June. So that is a good start. So that I think is what the, some of the information and the that the National Oversight Committee and the Prime Minister needs in order to, to really, along with all the other information that they have available, to really make the decision of saying, you know what, we can open in July, but you know what, let's open in August first, or let's open the 30th of July. You know, so that that is where I think that the, the having access to all of this information is what's going to present uh, a safer and a, a safer time for us to reopen the yeah. Philip Wilson Airport. So I, I, I really want to come back to that point about uh, what do you do know about safety protocols that will be put in place. But let's, let's be sure that we have people understand what the results of this survey is saying. Uh, there's a 50% 50 uh, 50 said they uh, agreed with a July 1st opening. Um, and then the other 50% was broken down to uh, different dates. Tell me the results there, John, so we can, we can talk about that further. Yeah, well, um, many of them felt that the, we, we should open in July. And I know what the, the main reason for that is because they, 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 f they have depleted all the these resources they had available to retain their staff and to be ready to reopen their operations. Yes. And I know that's the, one of the main reasons why many are pushing. And we understand that. I mean, we, we, we have, I have maintained that very clearly with our members, we understand the pressure that they are. We are all in the pressure, you know, under pressure. And we are all implementing measures to adapt so that we're able to survive and then we're able to recover. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the, the key issue is that we cannot be reactive. We got to be proactive. And if we would have been proactive two months ago, you know, I have been, I have been on the media, on our platforms, and I have been requesting, you know, we need to prepare these plans. You know, we need to prepare these yeah. plans for when we are ready to reopen. Where is the economic recovery plan for our economy? You know, and specifically, I was saying for the tourism industry, because so much is dependent of, of the tourism industry, and that creates a, an impact on all the other sectors. Absolutely. And, and more importantly, on the unemployment rate. Yeah. Right now, by the week, I can tell you the unemployment rate is increasing. So what is... What support is the private sector going to receive, and how? And that is also going to lead to the urgency of reopening the Philip Wilson International. So the survey stating that the 50 percent is saying in 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 July, and the other 50 were split with dates later dates. Yeah. But the main takeaway so the second is that highest num uh, date uh, was 22 percent for August 1st. And then you yes. had September 1st, 9%, October 1st, 11%, and November 1st, 11%. Um, yeah. But what this communicates to me, and how I interpret the survey, is that there is a date in mind that people feel that they can or, or should be ready by. Um, and this is part of the conversation that we do hear from those who are advocating for a July 1st date. In fact, they've been honest to say that you know, set July 1st, uh, announce it so that we can get bookings. And if we can't meet that target date, we can push back. Um, because you need to be able to be open for bookings so that uh, people who are looking for vacations at this time will have the option to choose Belize. Let, let's examine your, your statement, Marlene. You, you talk about people who want to book Belize, who want to come. I think there is an assumption out there that there are millions of people just sitting at home in the United States waiting for Belize to open the airport, and they will then start booking Belize. There are some facts we have to look at. Mm -hmm. In the best of times, okay, the best of times for most hotels, July and August are slow. Yes, there are some fishing and diving resorts that do a good bit of business, but let's put them aside for a minute. July and August are slow months. September and October are virtually dead months, okay? A lot of hotels uh, shut down for those months. So people who are telling you that, oh, once we open the airport on July 1st or whatever date we're talking about, that we're suddenly going to get a flood of reservations, 
um, I think they're trying to sell you a, a bridge over the, the city river. Uh, at best, okay, in a good year, we don't get a lot of business. How do you think the business is going to go when we're in a pandemic year? So the, the thing we have to be careful about is setting expectations high for whenever we open. The fact is that the, the pool of potential um, visitors to Belize has been so radically reduced by both the pandemic and the civil unrest in uh, the United States that in whatever date you open, you're going to get a bare trickle of visitors. Okay, so just opening the airport does not solve your problem. Okay, I think we need to be aware of that. I think the entire industry is anticipating that come our traditional winter season, let's say starting a week before Christmas, I think we're all assuming that at that time of year, we're gonna do enough business to at least get some cash flow going. I don't think there's argument there unless there's a second or third wave in the United States. But let's be real about this. Nobody's gonna be making money no matter when you open the airport until the, the winter season. Our point at BTIA, uh, the reason for us advocating the need for long-term low interest loans, particularly through DFC, is that we're looking at it in the long term. Um, our membership is going to be hurting. No matter what month you open the airport, we're gonna to need to survive till we get to the end of this crisis. And that's the, the, the long-term view that, that we're taking. Uh, and as far as when you open the airport, my personal feeling is that's really not gonna make much difference to the bottom line uh, of, of most of our members. Some of our members, maybe they own, they have construction projects, maybe they're building condominium hotels and they're trying to sell condominiums. I'm trying to sell land at my uh, real estate development. And the fact is without a personal visit, you're not gonna sell a condo or a piece of uh, a, a home site, okay? That is true, but that's a very different argument than saying that the tourism industry is going to suddenly come alive once you open the airport in okay. July. Now, now, I think, Stuart, you know, you make a valid point, and I, and I think that you perhaps, or maybe you would disagree, um, but it comes from a place of desperation. When, when there's no option for business, people simply want to have a option for business. Um, and so what I hear from you is that instead of perhaps the clamor for setting a date as soon as possible, that perhaps the, the advocacy should be geared towards how do you help people survive this difficult period? That would certainly be my advice. Yeah, I, I mean, just to, to put it in very clear terms, when you open the airport, as long as it's a, the, the PM has set a November 1st deadline, I think that's very realistic of him. I'm saying whenever you open the port between now and then is really not going to affect the bottom line of most tourism operators. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And it, yeah. Sorry. So let's look at let's look at what the uh, what your members did agree on, and resoundingly so. You're talking about things like uh, the medical safeguards that are in place. Um, my question just has to do with how involved are you in this process and what do you know? Because to any person just, you know, who, who critically analyzes the situation, what happens when, you know, you do a rapid test at the airport? Where do these people wait? What happens if there's a positive result? Do they go back? What if uh, they don't show symptoms until they're, you know, well situated at a bungalow in Naya? Are you completely quarantined after that? I mean, there's some questions I think that we just have not addressed in terms of how we go about the reopening. Are you aware of how much planning has taken place or um, allowing for some pre predictability that when and if um, people come in and there's the possible uh, positive case that comes in, how we'll respond? Um, Marlene, that is, that is what the survey really, really focused a lot into it because a lot of the members are concerned about what is in place you know where are the plans where is the re economic recovery plan where is the protocols and guidelines upon the arrival i mean and these are protocols and guidelines that are, have to be implemented by the public sector mm -hmm. uh, immigration customs you know people working at the, at the border management uh, at the airport uh, and then of course for the private sector all the individuals that are going to become frontline persons 
um, are gonna are, are have to be ready. They have to be prepared, um, you know, to to deal with the, with the arrival of these yeah. potential uh, tourists that may may basically have the virus, and we and, you know, and we just need to be able to to lower the risk for the tourists and for our population. But where are you in this planning? Because the BTIA does have a representative on the BTB. Um, and you mentioned earlier the Ministry of Tourism is working on something as well. Yeah. We also talked to a publishing agency who said they were publishing the guidelines um, and that was, was to be out by the end of the month. So there seems to be some preparations taking place. I want to know where you are in this process. Yeah, well, we contribute to those documents by, by revising, revising them and presenting recommendations if we see that something needs to be, uh, something needs to be included or something needs to be removed. So, so we, we receive those documents, we take a, a look at them, and then we provide feedback on them. Mm -hmm. And then once it, it has been properly consulted with all stakeholders, it would then be presented to the Ministry of Health, and they will be the final ones to do the, the final vetting, and then thereafter it should go to the National Oversight Committee. Um, one of the things that um, I guess you guys saw the letter being sent out by by, by some private some private businesses, yeah. and they were stating about a comprehensive plan. Uh, we we have not been a part of that process, so we really don't know the details of what that plan really entails and who is preparing the plan. Um, so so you know, I mean, this is where the we got to know the facts and everybody has to be involved in those processes if yeah. these documents are being prepared because we all have some stake in it and we all at some level based on our experience and knowledge can make some some positive contributions to, to the development of those plans so i think that that's where we need to to to, to ensure that the national oversight committee and the ministry of of tourism and the Belize Tourism Board, along with the public and private sector, are involved in this in the development of these plans. So that's where I think it is important to to, to get all the parties involved. And um, just to be clear, um, when we're speaking about planning, have you been involved in uh, planning in the sense of um, what or decide or contributing to what are going to be the factors to maintain health and safety? Um, I, but um, have you also voiced your concerns or um, been able to perhaps um, give some recommendations in terms of um, economic recovery and what measures are going to be needed so that the industry is going to remain viable over the next few months in light of what um, you know, Stuart was saying earlier? So I'm wondering if economic recovery has also been part of what the BTIA has been recommending. Uh, yes, yes, we have been making recommendations. As, as Stuart mentioned, one of the first things that we asked was that the, for the government to try to secure some affordable and special financing, financing program for, for the tourism sector mm -hmm. so that those that are in need of financing can have uh, access to financing that is, that's, that is on favorable terms and conditions yeah. that is not going to cripple them for the long run. You know, yeah. so it's not, and that is just one of the approaches. We have also asked that the government needs to take a look at the labor laws um, because there's a lot of unemployment and there's a, a lot of different scenarios in, under which a lot of people are losing their jobs. So I think that our laws need to be, be properly balanced to not favor the employer, not favor the employee, but to, to, to be able to provide that safeguard to both of them. Um, and then we, we, we need to have this comprehensive economic recovery plan and we, we have been asking that uh, we haven't heard anything from government we know what government is doing for the public uh, for the public sector uh, you know he has guaranteed their their, their salaries uh, which is uh, that go, alone goes a long way I mean you, that impacts over 16,000 people and you trickle, you add that with their families so it's a lot of it's a high percentage of the population is going to benefit by by the government providing a security yeah I, and so, Stuart me, and myself and yeah. other members of the of the board of directors, we have we are, we are going to be working with the Belize Network of NGOs, mm -hmm. and we are going to be working on, a, on a, an economic recovery plan, something that we're going to from our from the NGO community that we're going to be able to share with the National Oversight Committee, and we're hoping to have that ready by the end of, of June or before. So since our last conversation, when you first introduced what would have been one possible um, uh, solution. Um, you have actually, which was the low finance, uh, long-term loans. You've actually presented that position to the Development Finance Corporation. Uh, let's just rehash specifically 
what you have suggested to them. I think your term is something like seven to 10 years and you wanted uh, interest rates, uh, clearly low interest rates. Um, what, what has been the response so far since you have put forward the details of what you're asking for in terms of relief? Well, what we did was we, we shared a position paper mm -hmm. uh, um, detailing what we vision of this program. We don't know all the details, but we are telling you that this is what needs to be considered by the Development Finance Corporation and the government of the lease. Yeah. The, the response has been very positive and DFC. Actually, we are meeting with, with them this morning at 9.30 to discuss okay. the, the possibilities uh, of, of what this financing program can entail. You know, but we, we tell them it has to be a special program that, that is out of the box, something completely new that is going to be considered. You know, if we're saying below, one of the things to be considered is below 6% interest, but the lower, the better for the members, for the people that may be interested in financing opportunities. Yeah. Uh, we're saying it's a, it's, it's a long term, and based on the research we have done, and you, we have attended various webinars that indicate, and more specifically, the airlines, the airlines, internationally tell you that they are looking to the, the level of, to for us to return to the level of travelers in, that were, were seen in 2019 it's go, it's go, you are going to be able to return to it till 2022 2023 so mm -hmm. you're looking to two three years so it's going to be a slow process before you recover your tourism industry so that's the reason why we're asking for long-term financing five to seven to ten years you know but this is something that the financing corporation will have to determined based on what they have available. And, and there is, I mean, I, I think one of the things um, that we say is that there's not a lot of information, but within the region and internationally, there is some, you know, um, the, the estimation for the decline in, in the Caribbean region, according to S&P, is something to 60 to 70 percent by the end of the, uh, up to the end of the year. Um, I, I was looking at an article looking at the types of travelers that are most interested in traveling right now, and they're not the adventurers, um, they're not the elite jet setters, the backpackers and young families um, and young professionals. So it's also looking at the data that is available and considering, I mean, do we market differently here in Belize? Or it, it seems that we just want the airport to be open and we're, we're hanging on to the hope that things just go back to what it was before. Um, what are your thoughts on this and even looking at how we restrategize Re, how we re-strategize uh, the tourism industry itself? Uh, I, can, I think that the reopening of the airport in July is, is just one step forward towards beginning the process of recovering the, the tourism industry and, and to kind of kickstart the economy. Because the reality is that it's going to be a long process before we, we recover the tourism industry mm -hmm. as to what it was at the ending of, of 2019. And I think most of the private sector businesses understand that. So in their mind, the sooner we open the Philip Wilson International Airport, the sooner this recovery is going to start. For you, Stuart? Uh, I take a slightly different view um, from John, just a, a personal view, nothing to do with my position on BTIA. Um, you know, again, the. Let me go back to the, the protocols we were discussing earlier. Yeah. The, the key protocols we're talking about <clears throat> are screening at the airport. That is critical mm -hmm. because we know that no matter what we do, because no, even if, when a test is developed, no test is foolproof, we are going to have new cases of COVID-19 come into the country. Mm -hmm. that's, not a, that's not a question right, that anyone um, doubts okay yeah. so the more we can reduce the number of active cases that get through that net the better off we're going to be because truthfully we do not know if the health services uh, how they are going to be able to respond to to new cases you may get it with a super spreader or a super spreading event we don't know um, how prepared the health services will be so it's crucial better you can screen people at the airport, the better off we're going to be. Mm -hmm. The later you open the airport, the likelihood of having better screening procedures is, is going to be the case. So that's a, a question of time. Yeah. On the other end is, I think you alluded to it, is if we're going to have people with COVID-19 
visitors running around the country with active cases. They're all going to be staying at hotels. The question becomes, what do you do at your hotel when you have a case of COVID-19 hmm. confirmed, okay? We fortunately, at my hotel, we had a false alarm back in early March. So we, and the authorities dealt with it. We had the whole, you know, we went through the whole drill and it gave us a good preparation. We had to actually quarantine 14 people. Okay, and we, we did it great. Our whole staff was did it perfectly. But there is still the question of, okay, this was a tour group. They were quarantined beyond the days they were supposed to be at the hotel. So the question became, okay, who's going to pay for their rooms? And who's going to pay for their food? Who's going to pay for their transport? Now, fortunately, in this case, because it was a relatively small amount of money, the tour company that, that sponsored the tour paid for all that. But that is not always going to be the case. So it's important, as we were talking about earlier, to see what do you do when there is a case? Um, who has the liability? Same thing when uh, you, you define a case at the airport. Do you put them back on a plane? Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> you put them into isolation. Who pays for that isolation? Can you um, afford to, can you force a person to do these kind of things? So, and in the middle, you've got the, the health standards at all our hotels and, and other operations. That, Marlene, is actually the easy part. All of the hotels that are currently open for local business, we're dealing with this every day. So we have our health and safety protocols for our particular properties, for our particular properties pretty much well in hand. As far as establishing a book of standards for the whole industry, that's easy. That's cut and paste because you have so many other countries that have researched this and published their own, whether it's Puerto Rico, whether it's Jamaica, whether it's Bahamas, that's the easy part. And what I, I hate to say it, Marlene, but even when you have this 50 page thick book of what your cleaning protocols should be and your social distancing protocols, the majority of the industry is not going to follow them. Okay, let us understand that. And the BTB does not have the resources to go and police every hotel yeah. to see that every waiter and every person working in your kitchen is wearing a mask and keeping six feet away from each other and using a um, uh, an alcohol or, or, or safe bath for the dishes and silverware. Uh, that's just not going to happen. So we, we have to recognize that. We can publish all the health and safety protocols that we want. Maybe the larger and better managed hotels or the flag hotels will observe that. But your smaller hotels, we know how that goes. They, they, will, they can't follow every um, little protocol that goes on. And that may be fine. There's basic social distancing practices that we're all used to that should suffice pretty well. I'm not worried about that. Yeah. So how do you want, I mean, with the release of the results, this is um, one voice of the tourism sector. It's a poll of your membership, and, and that comes with its own limitations. But of course, it can easily be widely adopted that this is what the tourism sector is saying. Um, how important is it that, that the sector gets on the same page to be able to work towards where you want to go in, in even setting a date or ensuring that the, the protocols that are in place and finding uh, possible answers to the very same questions that you're asking in terms of liability and what happens if someone is quarantined. How important is it and how do you work towards kind of amalgamating the voice of the sector? Well, that is a, that is a good question. I think uh, that, that is one of the reasons why we, we, we came on, on your show to kind of provide more insights into what we believe the, the, the survey uh, is stating to the, to the public no, and to the government that, you know, what, what our membership is thinking. And as you rightfully say, we are only one voice of the many. There, there are other associations, there are other entities. Uh, and many, and we, we, we are receiving some scrutiny from, from different um, individuals and private businesses, you know, with regards to, to our survey, you know, yeah, there are some who say your survey does not represent what they have been advocating for directly with government. Well, like I can tell you, and some of those are our members, by the way. So they are part of what the poll really represents. But you, we got to use a democratic system and we got to represent what 
everybody is trying to say. Because everybody, as small as you are or as big as you are, you should have a voice to be able to, to state the recommendations because we can all be affected by this virus. Um, so it is only fair for us to provide that opportunity to all our members. And, and I believe that's what we did. And I, we're saying this is the BTIA membership's position. This is what they believe it should be enforced, should be looked at, should be considered, should be developed, should be planned, should be implemented by the government. That's all we are saying our, our, our members, from our members. Is, is there any um, disappointment coming from your members that out of the results you've chosen to say that you won't advocate? Um, because that is the decision that you made. You said it's too um, divided, and so basically you'll just leave the government to make the decision. But how are you the voice if you don't weigh into the conversation? Well, we are weighing into the conversation by saying that we need to have the proper protocols and plans in place. Mm -hmm. And that is what our members are keen. Uh, and like I mentioned, if you, if you look at the... there's. If you look at the question of opening in July, it's a 50-50 split. 50 said yes, open July, 50% is split over other dates. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. But 88% of them said, yes, let's open it, but once we have all the safeguards in place. And we cannot ignore that statement from the stakeholders, from 88% of our stakeholders. You know, that Could is a strong Could you not then just take a position, and let me just be devil's advocate here, and say, set a date. We need a definitive date. Yes, I, I, I believe we do. I believe we do. Whatever it's uh, and July 1st, July 15th, July 30th, August 1st, August 15th, we need a date because, like I mentioned to you, bookings are done ahead of time. So people need to know when things are going to actually be, be able to, to, to come. Yeah. People need to plan. So if the government makes a decision, you know what we're going to do with July 15th opening? Okay, we have no something to respond. Remember, people are getting inquiries on a daily basis about booking coming to Belize. Mm -hmm. Maybe it may not be millions or thousands of people, but they are getting inquiries of when they want to come to Belize. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Stuart mentioned about the real estate agents. You know, I, I, I've been communicating with the Association of Real Estate Brokers of Belize, and yeah. they, they are telling us, you know, there's a lot of big people that want to come into that Belize. Gonna bring, they're going to bring some, 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 some U.S. dollars and they want to do some business in Belize, you know, but they need the Philip Gorson International Airport for them to be able to, to plan and to come to Belize, to physically conduct business and see how they can invest in Belize and purchase and, you know, they will conduct the whole business process to, 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 to meet their, their interests. Mm -hmm. So we understand that. So that's, I think that's where government really needs to, to see, you know what, it's Belize. So the question to me right now that we, the government, and the National Oversight Committee, and even the private sector individuals that are allowing for, for our opening date, an exact opening date, is that we should be asking, is Belize ready to reopen? Are all stakeholders ready to, to, to reopen it? To welcome tourists? Right. Is, is the public sector ready to welcome tourists? You know, we need to ask I, I, I think the public sector is saying, yes, they need mm. U.S. dollars. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what they're saying. Um, and, no, and that's I mean, a I mean, whole other layer of this conversation that we didn't really get a chance to get into. Um, but we, we, we are out of time, and I want to give you an opportunity to make a, a closing point. Uh, Marlady, again, I would emphasize the old adage, be careful what you wish for. Mm -hmm. I think you have a situation that is facing the prime minister. It is the same exact situation that the leader of every country in the world is facing, yeah. that every US state governor or provincial governor all around the world is facing. They're trying to thread a needle, okay? It is to try and find that exact sweet spot that balances the health of the country and the economic um, prospects of the country. If you look around the world, how different leaders are handling it, some are just messing it up, Donald Trump, Bolsonaro uh, in Brazil, Brazil. even um, AMLO in Mexico, they have not done a good job. I think our prime minister here, I'm not going to vote for his party in the next election, but I will say I think he's doing a very good job in trying to thread that needle. Mr. Barrow has been called many things in his long career. 
but I've never heard anyone call him stupid. I think he knows what he's doing. I trust his judgment, and I wish him the best. Okay. John? Well, while, while we can, I just want to say to our members that we continue to, to represent their best interests. We, they, they tell us how to represent their best interests, and, and we, we're using the survey results as the basis of what we're going to continue doing right now. So we're going to increase our efforts in trying to, to have the influence and to, to the development of these plans, and so that we are as safe and secure when the international um, airport reopens. So, and we want to let them know, keep the communication channels open. We're sending a weekly bulletin to share in updates of yeah. what we're doing. And I've even put my cell number out there to, for them to reach out to me via WhatsApp or direct call. And I'm, and I'm very pleased to see that many have taken that and they have gotten in contact with me. Okay. And we, I want to assure them that we keep working for, for their best interest. And you do and meet with DFC we, today as well, right? Yes, yes. We, okay. We're going to let them know how these conversations are going are gonna to be moving forward. And... And like I mentioned, we, I share these updates on a weekly basis. Every Monday, we send out a bulletin with all the necessary updates of what has been taking place during that week. And I can tell you, there's a lot of things moving. So uh, the, my best advice is for the membership to keep, uh, to stay informed and to stay in communication with us. All right. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and having this conversation this morning. Thank you, too. Thank you. All right. And we are going to go ahead and take a break now. And when we come back, the focus is going to be on blood donations. So please stay tuned. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltex Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. <laughs>